I'm going to introduce the panel that we have here this evening. Uh, just beside me here, we have Porig Odir, who is a professor emeritus from the college where we are this evening, from D uh, DCU St. Patrick's. Um, beside Porig Odir, we have Natasha Fogarty. Uh, Natasha is a student, um, currently a teacher training student in her second year at Maynooth. Uh, beside Natasha, we have Joseph O'Malley Melani. Yeah. Uh, and Joseph is another student at third level. Uh, he's studying to become a post-primary teacher. Um, and both of these students will talk about their own experience um, and how the exemption impacted or didn't impact, impact on them. And finally, we have Dr. Emily Barnes. And Emily is, um, I'm just going to get your title correctly here, sorry. Emily is Assistant Professor in Language Education um, at the School of Education at Trinity College in Dublin. So um, I'm going to start by, by asking you, uh, Porik Odir, can you tell us what exactly the exemption uh, system is? Yeah, well, I suppose the, the system originated um, back in the, the late 70s and, and to the 80s and 90s where children um, who had been educated in special schools or in special classes didn't learn Irish and then there was a, a move to mainstream those students. So obviously moving from a situation where they weren't learning Irish into the mainstream school, it made sense that they would receive an exemption from the study of Irish. Um, so that was one reason then, so really around learning, additional learning needs, especially education needs, children with those needs didn't learn Irish, so they got an exemption. And uh, the other category of exemption typically was those who received their education abroad. So typically mm -hmm. people coming to Ireland now uh, in increasing numbers, but also children perhaps of diplomats and so on who spent three years or more uh, away uh, outside of the country. And that's kind of the, the, the origin of it. Now, just um, that they, they are two quite narrow categories you've described, especially the second. I mean, there would have been very few children coming into the system at that time who would mm. have received their education abroad. Um, it, it, it would be my impression that it's gone very far beyond that. It, what, what is the spread of it at the moment? Yeah, so, so at the moment, 12% um, of, of uh, students at post-primary have an exemption from the study of Irish, and it's about 2.5% uh, at primary. Um, so the, the, the system in the 90s, I suppose, what, what we saw in the 90s is that uh, there, was far, there was a huge investment in um, special education needs, um, far more teaching resources, um, assessment and diagnosis. So the number of, of children, for example, being diagnosed with dyslexia has increased greatly. It's not that they didn't exist previously, it's just that they, they weren't being mm -hmm. diagnosed. There are, there's an increase in the number of, of children on the autistic spectrum and so on. And uh, in a way, because there was a tradition of exemptions there, it kind of carried forward um, but we in the sort of 50 years since since the exemption system started we have a far better understanding of what inclusive practices are how we can include children with additional needs in our classes without necessarily give them giving them uh, an exemption and i suppose as as brian mooney said recently the the exemption system is a system of exclusion rather than inclusion and the department is very strong on promoting a system of inclusion which essentially is for, for teachers the challenge is, and it is a challenge, is how do I um, adapt my teaching to meet the needs of all the children in my classroom, not how do the children adapt to meet how I teach. Yes. And essentially, that's, that's partly, so it's not to say that no children should have an exemption, but in 1999, for example, so 25 years ago, 2.5% of students had an exemption, and now you can see the growth to 12 percent so some of that is to do with children uh, immigrants to the country and once again i think that's that's the new ireland and that's the new reality and i don't think a system that was there 40 50 years ago is fit for purpose for those and i think we should be looking at how can we, how we can teach irish to those coming into our country we may not require that they do is sit the leaving cert that everyone else sits but should we not be giving the, those the opportunity to learn irish rather than saying assuming immediately oh they won't be interested in irish they need english that's very interesting because it goes to the whole notion of, 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 of citizenship and belonging as well. 
uh, that point, uh, that last point you made. Uh, Emily Barnes, can I ask you, as somebody who's an expert in the, this area of language, what is the rationale behind, or what is the, the idea that, that some children can't learn a language? Uh, can, you, can, you, can you flesh that out, or is, is that a thing, or how do you view that as somebody who has expertise looking at language? So, um, it, when Porik was speaking there, what I was thinking about was, you know, in the 60s and 70s, bilingualism was viewed sceptically for all children. So. Um, F, it was considered to be negative for all children. And I think that little, um, unfortunately, it's, it's hung on, but only for children with special educational needs or additional educational needs. We have a really good understanding now that bilingualism doesn't negatively impact people, but unfortunately, there's still um, a perception among some groups or some people that, um, that it could potentially negatively inf impact um, children with additional educational needs. We know from the science in this area, there's a huge amount been done, um, for example, working with st uh, students with um, Down syndrome or on the autism spectrum um, to look at whether or not it really does impact them negatively and whether they can learn a language. And all of the research that we've seen to date shows that there's no cost, no cost to their first language through learning a second language or becoming bilingual. Um, in the case of students with dyslexia then, um, it's well, we're looking at two different things here. We're looking at um, within the child, is it going to negatively impact their first language by learning second language? And then th there's also another thing you can do, which is to compare um, people with additional educational needs to people without. And that's something that's often done. And um, that's kind of the rationale provided often for exemptions, that uh, someone will have uh, either an inability or a lesser ability to acquire a second language than their peers who, are, um, who don't have any uh, additional needs. Um, the Can I ask you, yeah. just, uh, you're talking about how, how children with, uh, with special needs or additional needs, you believe that they are capable of, of learning a, a, a second language, but can we, can we first of all look at uh, what are the benefits to any child, what are the benefits of bilingualism I, I, to the brain, to, to language? Can you, can you go through, and I'm actually speaking of, as the parent of a child who, who's, who is half Spanish, so who grew up with that initial bilingualism and then Irish through school, but so it just, uh, what impact does that have on, on, on a child to have, to be bilingual? So there's, um, there's advantages in kind of in the areas of, um, of language, of executive function, which is kind of all of our planning and attention, switching attention of tasks and so on. Uh, and then, of course, in the area of culture and um, connection, social connection, which is hugely important and often forgot about. Usually we focus on the cognitive benefits because I, there's something catchy about kind of that as a phrase, I think, and as a concept. But really, I think the real strength of becoming bilingual is that it connects you to other people, to communities and to your culture. But beyond that, if we want to look at language, um, it can... Um, uh, increase your metalinguistic awareness, so your awareness of how languages work, how they're put together, um, which can ease the learning of a third language, for example. Um, in terms of cognitive uh, function then, uh, we're looking at executive function, being able to switch tasks easily, and being able to suppress one thing and focus on another thing, because that's what we're doing all the time as bilinguals, uh, suppressing one language to, uh, to speak the other. So those would be kind of the cognitive benefits, and those are true for every child, for every person and not limited to any group in particular. Now, I took you off track, so I want to go back on track, uh, because there is this notion, look, you know, my child's going to struggle anyway in school uh, because of their disability, therefore I want to try to ease the burden, and I will look at subjects that I feel, you know, they're not going to need that, and actually it's going to make their life easier in school. Um, and that's what a lot of parents would think if they're looking at their child and really hoping that their child is going to succeed in the system w with a disability. But, you, but you're saying that, 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 that very many children with, for example, dyslexia can, I'll let you take it from there, that you, yeah. you're saying that it shouldn't be a problem for them. So 
it's not the case that it won't be a problem for any child, of course. Um, and I think what we need to look at here is the difference between group studies and individual, kind of looking at the individual level rather than the group level. So, um, for example, there's few of these studies around. Usually groups look at, um, or studies look at two different groups, uh, children with dyslexia, children without dyslexia, and they compare them. They compare the means of the two groups. And often you'll see that um, they find that uh, that the dyslexic group has lower language attainment, lower second language attainment. But there are very few studies that look within that group and all the variability within that group. So a really nice study was done by um, a person called Alexa von Hagen in Frankfurt. And she looked at a dyslexic group of students learning their second language compared to a non-dyslexic group. And within that, she found that over half of that group were just as capable as their peers in learning their second language. So first of all, it's not the case that all students with dyslexia will struggle with, struggle with a second language. The second is, is the linking of ability to inclusion. So is it OK if it's likely that someone is going to struggle? Is it OK just to exclude them on that ground without actually providing them with additional support or op opportunities to have additional support? So. Uh, Okay, yeah. thank you very much, thank you very much. Oh, do, did you want to continue? Were you in midpoint? Sorry, I didn't. Okay, so, um, so I think, you know, um, when we're speaking about this issue, I think there's looking at kind of um, taking a more nuanced view, but then also not going to exclusion as the first port of call um, is really important and looking at what we can do. And you touched as well on kind of this perceived utility, the, the perceived usefulness of, of Irish as a language. I think anyone, all of us here would say, like, I, I definitely for me, I would have never gotten the opportunities that I've gotten only for Irish. And I'm here today speaking with kind of my research hat on. It's an area of interest for, for me. But I also taught Irish to adults for uh, a number of years uh, in evening classes. And um, each term, pretty much every term I did, there'd be someone who had gotten an exemption and had come back to learn Irish in a beginner's class. Sometimes it was because they wanted to do teaching. Sometimes it was because their own kids were grown now and were going to Gaelskilne and they wanted to be able to speak to them. And sometimes it was for the music and culture. So I just think setting, I think that limiting a child's choices at age eight or nine and, and providing them with, a dis with an exemption and not considering that that might be them one day wanting to do teaching, it might be them one day sending their kids to a grade school and wanting to know what's going on. You don't know what their life has in store. So I, I think making sure that people have as many options as possible open to them and supporting them in doing so is the best kind of course of action. Thanks very much, Emily. And that tees up uh, Natasha Fogarty's story, I think, very neatly. Yeah. Um, Natasha, you you were in primary school. You were like everybody else in your class. You were doing Irish. Um, tell me about yourself, and tell me what happened when you you went into secondary school and why it happened. Yeah. So I did. Um, I went through primary school, mainstream primary school, um, from junior and all the way up to sixth class. Um, I do have cerebral palsy. Um, so like I did initially start out on like an early start, like setting in a uh, special needs school, but then immediately like going from junior cert up to mainstream, up to sixth class in mainstream. Um, did Irish all the way throughout. It, I don't even think there was ever a mention of an exemption in primary school. Like not that I was aware of in any way. Um, loved Irish in primary school. And then when I got to secondary school was when it kind of got proposed to me um, an exemption. Um, I was 12 going into first year and it was posed to me about an exemption and me being 12 like saying sure it was a, a subject that I got to drop not knowing what I wanted to do with my life in the future. So I took the exemption in, in first year and I done like different extra classes like um, extra maths, a bit of extra English and then like like different things to, like skills like development. And why did they, what did they say to you when they suggested, like why you? Um, I think it was based a bit off my cerebral, cerebral palsy, like I was only in secondary school a few weeks and it was kind of saying we think this might benefit you more by if you do, do you want to do these skills development and at the time I didn't see any issue with that, I thought like best interest at heart, like I was sure that that'd be... When you talk about skills development you talk about, the, the, you mentioned to me earlier, learning to type with both hands. Yes, yeah, so I went to uh, IT school and basically I was learning how to... Um, I used a laptop in school because um, my note taking was a bit like below average on pace. So we found like a laptop would suit me better. So we done, I done like um, 
like a typing program to try to learn how to type with two hands. Now, it do, I do type just with my left hand. I just find it easier. It's just faster for myself. Like I'm sure them, um, those types of programs do work for a lot of people, but for myself, I just think the benefit would be more to type with one hand. Um, so I kind of went through then my junior cycle, kind of doing similar things through first, second, and third year. And then I went into transition year, and this was kind of a turning point for me. Um, I really benefited from transition year, like uh, across the board. And then I'd done my work experience in a primary school, in my old primary school, and adored it. I was like, I really want to like, see, what, what this, see what I can do about this. But then I went back in, and I knew not having the Irish was the issue. And so transition year, that was at the start of transition year. And I was like, OK, so what can I do to kind of let me get to that? Like, what do I need to do in order to do teaching, basically? Because um, primary school teaching was the goal. So um, it was kind of like, I think it was nearly like tiptoed around, like, oh, we don't know if that's a good idea. Like, even myself, I was a bit nerv nervous about what I, like, I'd have to pick up honours Irish at that, not even ordinary level. So my transition year summer, I decided to go to the Gwail Talk. I went down to Mayo um, for two weeks by myself, um, with only primary school level Irish. Um, I says, look, I gotta like see, like I think that was kind of the point where I could decide if I really wanted to, like pursue it. Went down for the two weeks, loved it. Came back with, like enough Irish that I'd get, I could hold a conversation. I think, um, even though it might not seem a lot, like a lot of Irish to someone, but it was a big achievement for myself considering I only had the bare minimum at the time. So then I came back in to school in fifth year and I said, okay, I want to pick up my Irish. I like, I really want to do teaching. And it was kind of like a bit of very sure, like I really had to think about it. So, um, and then uh, my career guidance counselor actually found this program in Minute called Rising Teachers, Rising Leaders. And basically it was a program that facilitated for people that wanted to get into teaching, like students, it was fifth and sixth year students who wanted to get into teaching but like might have been from like disadvantaged areas or different or do you know them type? So I actually, they went out to schools, but I didn't qualify because I, did, I was in a different school. So, but we reached out and I think my career guidance counselor, like teacher, said, um, emailed explaining my story. She really wants to do Irish, wants to become a primary school teacher. And then I did that for two years, every Saturday or every second Saturday for two years. And that was, Sorry. No, no, that's fine. And you were doing Irish in school at this stage? Yes, yes. I picked up my honours Irish at fifth year and then every second Saturday I was going into Minute okay. um, with another group of students doing Irish classes um, as well as like, it, it's kind of like a teaching module. Why do you want to be a teacher? And looks at different types of te like practices. And how and was, the, I know you had your two weeks or your three weeks, was it two weeks? Two in, weeks. Two weeks in Mayo <laughs> and primary school Irish. Yeah. How, how did you cope in fifth, in fifth year? With fifth year honours Irish at that point? <laughs> um, I won't lie, it was really challenging. I, like at the start, I think it was a real challenge for me, but I, I think I'm quite stubborn, like as in, like I had like people in the background saying, it's not possible, it's not this, and it, like even like my parents would say to me, if someone tells me I can't do something, it's nearly like just a little fire, kind of a little bit of a red button. Um, but I did, but then I think it was just constant, like it was a confidence thing and having the support, that's the main thing, it's all about mindset and the support you have behind you. Um, yeah. Luckily, my teachers were great. Um, support, like, offered me support. And I think leaving Cert Irish then, I got nearly a shock when I went into college because it's very, very different. Because I was nearly playing catch up on grammar because I think junior cycle focuses a bit more on the grammar side and stuff like that. And then it was more so memorizing the essays and memorizing the poems and kind of getting myself to that point. Was and I should, I should say, just uh, again for anybody uh, listening who may not know this, but you need Irish to do yep. primary school teaching. Yeah. So just so that people are clear on that's why this oh, yeah. was so important for you. Yeah. Um, and now you're in, you're in second year uh, 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 training as a teacher. Yeah. Um, but I think some people, like, there is a lot of misconceptions around it. Like, there is more than one route. And the minute I talk to any, like, people in secondary school, they say, oh, you're doing teaching. Like, that seems so hard. And I'm like, but there's other routes around it. So I'm doing, like, at the minute, I'm doing six years instead of four. Because, so I done my turn rising teachers. I done my leaving cert. I got the grade. I got to H four, but I, unfortunately, I didn't get the points for my mm -hmm. for to, to get into primary school teaching. But I applied for a turn to teaching. It's a foundation course in Minute as well, kind of co-hosted by the rising teachers. And you do like an interview, and it's kind of similar to like um, nearly how you get into a master's, like a personal essay mm -hmm. and an interview. Um, and luckily enough, um, I got a place. So I knew before I got my CEO that I got into this course. So I knew that was a backup before I got my CEO um, offers in August. Um, so unfortunately, I didn't get my CEO offer. 
I got like a, my fourth offer, but I just knew I was like, do you know what? I turn to teach, and I think I'll do that one first. And it's a year long program, and we done the same kind of Irish, and um, like turn to teaching module. So like I looked at different topics within education and like different things you might come across in your classroom. So it was really really interesting, as well as like university skills. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And just I know I'm, I'm going off topic. If you allow me, just for a minute. Yeah. Briefly, what would you say? You began to say it there, but somebody who may be listening going, I'd love to be a teacher, but that's not me. Yeah, I For think whatever reason, what would you say to them? Do your, like, go find, like, literally go look up research. Like, there's definitely back roots into teaching. Like, that's just mine. I know there's otherwise, like, you can do your arts route and then two, two years in your master's. I know um, a lot of people do it that way as well. But I think sometimes, especially in schools, when there's a, such a focus on like you're leaving cert in college and you're it's very narrow especially when you're 70 and 18 and you, you just feel like you need to get through it but then you forget that there's you need to just look around just and you're saying it. you can do it yeah there's ways yeah there's ways Excellent. around it basically joseph can i turn to you your your situation is is almost the exact opposite um uh, because because you did irish yes um you could have you could have taken an exemption can you t tell me your situation? Yeah, so uh, as I was going through my primary school education, I went to Gwell School in uh, Kundalitrima. And there was definitely, there was, uh, my teachers had realised there was a difference in my learning. So at age nine, uh, when I was in third class, um, my teacher and the principal in the school recommended to my parents that I seek uh, an educational psychologist to see was there a, dif uh, a diagnosable difference in learning. And so at that stage, I was diagnosed as uh, dyslexia. And the educational psychologist's recommendation for me was to be exempted from Irish, removed from the Gwale School, and put into a local uh, English or yeah, English medium primary school. But I have my parents, who were big advocates for the Irish, and the principal in the school, along with the teacher, they also felt it would be detrimental to my experience in primary school to pull me from the Gwale School. So instead, together, the, uh, along with the SEN coordinator in the uh, Gwale School. They decided it would be best to keep me in the Gwale School and provide me the extra tuition, both in Irish and English. So I got an hour, uh, an hour a day, one to one, with the SEA and coordinator in the primary school, all the way up until sixth year or sixth class. Apologies. From that, then went into um, me, uh, English medium uh, secondary school. I kept up my Irish. I done higher level up until I was in uh, sixth year. I started the last minute. I sort of decided, okay, I'll drop to ordinary level because I was thinking about oh, points wise. Didn't really need it. Came out and. And uh, oh one in Irish at the time, or in Irish, yes. Um, and then, uh, yeah. So then, from that, went on to college. I'm currently studying to be a uh, engineering and graphics teacher in a second secondary level. I'm final year, almost finished. So uh, just and tell me, was that. it was it um, you had dyslexia? Was it was it a struggle? Was the Irish? You managed. You had the yes. extra, but but was it hard? Oh, it definitely was hard. Now. There was definitely strategies implemented to assist me in my studying of both Irish and English. Like we'll say that hour a day I was getting of extra tuition. There was definitely a mix, like some days we do English, some days we do Irish, focusing on my phonological reasoning, uh, progressing my skills onwards, working towards word banks, that sort of thing, as strategies to assist me as a dyslexic student in a Gwale school, have a good experience at primary school. Um, and it definitely was a struggle at times, I won't lie, but Irish, Irish for me was great insight into the country we're in. I was able to look at this, this uh, history, the culture, all these, the, these different things that are quite important part of my identity now. Was there ever a time as a child that you felt, I, 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 this is too hard, I, I don't want to have to struggle like this? Yeah, that, that struggle sort of came on later, particularly when I was in second year in uh, secondary school, I thought, geez, I could get out of here easy. I could go, go over to the, um, the resource class, as it was called at that stage, um, and I was thinking, but it just took a bit of time and a bit of speaking to others who said, look, you've got a good standard of Irish, as in I'd have a good standard of Irish at the time. And they said, look, it's best off keeping that. You're, yes, you will get benefit from being in a resource class, but that Irish is something you're good at. Keep it up. Now, definitely had struggles, but I sort of had to work through them, put in a bit of effort. Well, others might have all, we'll just read out that page, that's grand. I definitely struggled with that a bit more. I'd have to go maybe put my ruler below it, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Can I turn to you, for, back to you for a minute, Park? Because uh, there, you, you spoke about a Gwale skull. I mean, there is this sense also that there's kind of a, a bit of a, 
whether it's a social division or that there are divisions creeping into the system because people feel, well, you know, the Gwail Scullina don't take kids, you know, say with, with disabilities or, you know, or, you know, or, or, or with difficulties that, that, you know, so there is this sense that, you know, and that's obviously not a, not a healthy situation. Um, so, I mean, that kind of, when you were talking, when you were in a Gwail Skull, if you, if you, if your parents had, wanted an exemption for you that would have been you'd have, you'd have moved out of that system mm. and I know of children who leave Gwael Scullina because they've been diagnosed say for example with dyslexia and their parents are kind of told look if you send them to this other school uh, that that school will deal with them much better I mean th that's a, that's a problem for for Gwael Scullina isn't it well, it's it's a problem for it's a it's a problem for the education system it's, it's not actually true about 10 percent of children in okay. Gwael Scullina so my my uh, former colleague Sinead Andrews has done research in this area. So about uh, one in ten children in a grade school have a, a recognised special yeah. education need. So the children are being educated. The perception maybe outside of mm -hmm. the sector is that this isn't happening, but actually it, it is happening. 10% you know, would be lower than in English medium schools, but that's not the fault of the, the grade school. Now when you have speech and language therapists and some psychologists recommending that children be removed from a grade school, mm -hmm. for, for, for no reason the research does not back up so the research we have from immersion education in Canada and Wales and the Basque Country and so forth does not support the kind of recommendations we get in Ireland for children with, with needs. So as I, was, as I was saying earlier, the question for the grade school is how do we cater for children with these needs? And one of the things that exemptions does, and again, this is borne out by the international experience in the very limited cases, the very limited countries where there are exemptions, um, typically there aren't exemptions you know, yeah, throughout Europe, wanted to ask. Yeah, throughout yeah, Europe, yeah. people, counterparts, yeah. I'm sure Emily's had the same experience when we meet people from other countries, when we ask them about exemptions, it takes us a while to explain what we mean because they, don't, they have no concept of it and then they immediately say, but surely you have inclusive education policies, they can't understand why children would not be learning Irish. Um, but, but just to... to to, um, to, to finish that point anyway. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that in the, in the US in, at high school level, you can have some great substitutions and their experience there is that once you introduce something like that, it removes the pressure on the system to learn how to deal with children with difficulties. So the danger would be that in, in, in grade school, in the, if, you, if, you, if you keep transferring children out, well then the teachers in those schools don't actually mm -hmm. learn the, the teaching skills to actually support all those children. So sometimes you can have a grail school where the teachers will actually say to their parents, oh, they might be better off in an English medium school because those teachers have not had the opportunity, as it were. You know, you could mm -hmm. make parallels with the medical profession. If there were certain cases or type diseases that they weren't seeing, they wouldn't be able to treat them because they wouldn't have the experience. So it's very, it's a problem for the education system, but it's really important to know, I think, that just like Joseph's experience, there are children in, in grail school, and about 10% at the moment, who do have those needs and whose needs are being met. Yes, and there's also the issue around the Gwales Cullen of, of, and this was the other category I was thinking of in terms of, uh, you know, the, the children whose parents may be foreigners, you know, mm. and, and who, who again, people feel, well, are, are, are enough kids from ethnic minority backgrounds, for example, going, you know, is, is the language a barrier or, or are, are attitudes towards the language a barrier? But I wanted to ask you, Emily, um, and I'm not sure if this, this, this question is in your area, so tell me if not, but like, Parents may be listening to this and, and feel that this debate, in a way, is pushing to have a right almost taken away from their child. That if their child, because there is this sense, oh, he's got dyslexia, therefore he can go for an exemption. That it's, it's a right you have if you, if you have come into the country after a certain age or if, if you have a, uh, some kind of disability that they feel... But, but, so what would you say to those parents? I think they'd be absolutely justified in thinking that because that's, what, that's the story that is kind of out there. That's what's presented to people is that you have this, um, an, an exemption is a good thing and it's a way to kind of relieve pressure in school. So I wouldn't be surprised that someone would think about it in that way. Um, and I think that it takes a huge amount of changing of attitudes, which is the main issue here. Above anything else, we have resources and so on and um, what we really need is a changing of attitudes from the from the top from kind of coming from the department of education and um, filtering down you know them kind of putting their inclusive education commitment into practice 
um, filtering down into educational psychologists, making sure that they're aware of the research, that they're not spreading any um, maybe outdated information or outdated opinions to teachers and to parents who are, of course, look at them for the answers because they're thought to have the answers. Um, so I think kind of um, ensuring that people um, have access to the research and changing attitudes that way would be the biggest um, kind of the most effective way in letting people have a less kind of negative view uh, towards Irish and maybe not looking at exemptions as the way out. And can I ask you, Emily, or Porg, and then I want to go back to this, Natasha and Joseph in the centre there, but what examples would you look to or would you point towards for parents internationally? And maybe, Porg, if you would come on this, you know, is it, is it Wales? Is it further afield? What about, you know, countries like Spain that have a lot of, um, you know, regional uh, languages that, that, that are, are on a par with Spanish? I mean, it, what do you think is a good model? So, oh, um, interestingly, I work on um, I work on a program, the Emid Sinedrus Langwega Agusquelsa in Trinity, and we had a, an international symposium for our students in January, and we had a speaker over Melissa Dockrell Garrett from New Brunswick in Canada, where they have French and English um, immersion similar to here, and um, what she had said was that. Basically, the students asked her afterwards, said, what about exemptions? And she said, oh, that kind of was outdated in the 90s in New Brunswick. They've gone towards an inclusive education system where there aren't divisions between special uh, schools uh, and, and mainstream schools, if you like. Um, and I think that that is a possible, if it's really well resourced, and that's the key thing in anything that's done, is that it has to be extremely well resourced and has to be a lot of investment in it and time given to teachers to re redesign their practice and, the, and, their, um, and their content and everything, which is hugely time consuming. Um, so I've gone off topic a little bit. No, but it's but very <laughs> interesting anyway. <laughs> but you, you say you, you're pointing to, to New Brunswick as a, as a, as a model that is, is worth emulating. A, a model that is worth emulating if we take the principles and invest heavily in it in terms of resources, yes. Um, oh, do you want to come in there, Paul? Yeah, do absolutely. Link, yeah, yeah. That. It's just one of the things yeah. you said about, you know, the typical reaction of a parent maybe if a child is diagnosed with dyslexia. Uh, okay, well, if they drop Irish or get an exemption, that'll make life life easier, you know. And I think sometimes, and and it's my daughter. My daughter has dyslexia, and I went through that sort of thought process myself going back many years. She, she's a, she's an adult now, but. Um, one of the things I think is, to, we, we, you know, we want to make things easier, but actually making things easier isn't necessarily the best thing. And I think that's kind of mm -hmm. part of the lesson around exemptions. And, and sometimes, you know, the children become very stressed and think, oh, I can't learn Irish, I'm not able to. So unfortunately, the, the criteria we have now for exemptions, they were changed in 2019, f five years ago. So now if, if a child um, has less than 10% on a spelling test, or a word reading test or a comprehension test, they're pretty much entitled to a, a, um, an exemption. And it's kind of established in the system out there. So school principals now make the decision, whereas prior to 2019, it was a psychologist assessment was required. Mm -hmm. So it kind of makes official that, oh, if, I, if I'm less than the 10 percent, I'm not able to study Irish. But that actually isn't the case. You know, Joseph yes, is a I've very, seen is, Joseph is, is, nodding is a, there. Joseph is a really good example. Yes. And, you know, in the case of my own daughter, she had five, she was in the fifth percentile, so she was the five percent weakest mm -hmm. in the country for her age group in spelling, word reading. But when it came to reading comprehension, she's 60 percent. Mm -hmm. You know, so just taking one test, which is what the criteria do, so a low score on one test is, is you know, it's not reliable. Um, so that's, that's part of the damage I feel has been done by the current criteria, that it's spreading false information mm -hmm. <laughs> that's not backed up by practice elsewhere. Mm -hmm. or, or research elsewhere and it has this this false notion if i make it easier for my child but as emily has outlined earlier on mm -hmm. being bilingual it, it involves the brain working a little bit harder because I'm, I'm suppressing now what i might normally be talking about in irish go and talk about it in english and so on um, so actually making it easier for the children in the long run isn't necessarily mm -hmm. the best policy it's funny because what what a lot of parents would would see as an advantage to their child uh, you're using a word like damage, which is, mm. it, it, I'm kind of like, 
It's a very different way of looking at it. But, but Joseph, you were nodding when, you, when, when Park was saying, you know, the, the, making things easier is not necessarily the right thing to do, for, for example, for a child with dyslexia. Yeah, and that's just it. Like, when we look, we're trying to constantly, like, I, as my own studies are shown, we're, or, sorry, my studying of uh, education is shown, they're very much we're trying to include as much people as possible in all our practice. With then, when we have a system where it excludes a certain cohort of students, it very much takes away from their ability to be as to interact with as my students. And then, like that, like in my own experience, I very much found that having that bit of Irish, I was able to you know have a conversation with someone, I come across them with their phone on that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, it just there is something to having that bit of Irish, being able to speak, being able to put and mm -hmm. as. Uh, Porrick and Emily were saying, putting the brain under a bit of pressure. You know, be able to work with uh, the, the struggle that is dyslexia. And dyslexia is a learning difference. It's not, a tr it is a learning challenge, but it's a learning difference. We, there is ways to combat it. And I very much feel that, and what was what my experience about when teachers put in the effort, when we adapt our practice, we can very much assist mm -hmm. our students with learning differences and include as much people mm -hmm. as possible in our classroom. Because we don't want a whole way, and especially when taking away the requirement of having the educational psychologist report for an, uh, an exemption from Irish, putting that pressure on the principals as well, it's definitely having a knock on effect, mm -hmm. and it's definitely pushing up the numbers, which is from what we can see. Uh, Natasha, can I go to you? You were given the, the easy option. Now, you mentioned briefly when you were talking how you felt about it at age 12, you felt fine. Yeah. But looking back now, uh, and, and and looking back to that 12-year-old child who was told, you have cerebral palsy, therefore, this is what we're going to do. This is what we're going to propose. How do you feel about that now? That, that the fact that that decision was almost made for you. I mean, you were 12. Um, I think it's like, it is very hard as a child to, to like, like at that age, I was like willing to accept it. It's fine. But I, as well, I do, as I go back to support again, it's been able to, especially because I was so young, for my parents to be able to support me when I came around at 16 saying, actually, I want to be able to do this. And like, I could imagine, like there is a worry there then saying, but will your child be able to do this? And like, but to, uh, having the support and the confidence to be like, it's worth a try. It's worth like, well, even when I look back on it now, I'm, I'm like, I'm great. I'm grateful for it because it's where I am. It's kind of molded me into what I'm doing at the minute and molded me who I am, molded me into who I am today. Like it's always going to be part of the journey into teaching. What is going to be? What are you saying you're grateful for? Like, I'm grateful for the fact that I got the opportunity to come back into the language. I'm grateful for the fact that but I had the opportunity. But to go back again, how do you feel about the fact that that decision was made for you when you were 12? I know it's... It's, it's frustrating it's, now when I think about it because yeah. it's like, what if? Like, what if that didn't happen? What if I continued with Irish? Would I have gotten the original route that I planned? Would I have went somewhere else with it? Like, it's kind of... A what if situation but at the same time you can't they're saying what I know but I'm, I'm just yeah. I, I mean as an outsider like you were disadvantaged by yeah. that decision and I do speak to school principals say who have a, a lot of students who maybe came here as as older children and were mm -hmm. never given the opportunity to to pick up Irish and th then when they're coming up into fifth and sixth year the principals will say well we're concerned because they don't have enough subjects, subjects. or yeah. they you know there's problems those yeah. those students face disadvantage and they they all are already coming from a position of disadvantage but yeah. but uh, and i'll ask another question about that in a moment but but can i ask both of you now i know joseph your family uh, you, you know you had a kind of a, a background in irish so but 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 natasha you for example i mean you you've gone to extraordinary lengths to actually learn irish yeah. how do you feel about the language I love it now. Do you? <laughs> I do, yes. No, I love it. And I think I get great joy because it is a constant work on. Like, I know I'm not at the stage that I want to be at yet. And it's kind of my, like, I build on it as I go. And it's kind of my thing that I do consistently. Um, but I do think even, like, again, going back to the point, it, even as teachers, you're, you're not supposed, like, it's not about fitting the children into the system. It's the system wanting to cater for all the children. Like, I feel like it's, even though there is, like, percentage of, people like the percentage is so big with exemptions at the minute like so high and I think it is about having a system but not a system that is kind of like taken away from the people I think it was very shown that like you're not able it's like if you want I feel like 
it's not given the choice to the children at the minute. I feel like it's very given as this is what we think you should do and this is what we think. Like, I feel like it's not, it's nearly being told to them at the minute rather than letting them have a choice and saying, well, let, why don't you try it out for a little mm -hmm. while and see how you get on rather than saying, no, this won't work at all. Like I was in first year, like even if I tried it for the first year and then came back and they asked me saying, well, what do you think? And I could have gave my, well, actually, I don't mind. I'm, at, I'm really enjoying it. And I think even that little change of like how it was posed to me, I think even by asking me, well, do you want to give it a try? Or what do you, I feel like I could have went down a very different path. But. And, and, and you're talking about giving you as a 12 year old a bit of agency, but sometimes, <laughs> You know, maybe you as a 12 year old may not have the <laughs> because if you, if you give a 12 year old yeah. charge of their education, they might say, Well, I want to just play That's football very true. all the time. Yeah, or um, but, but can I go to you, Joseph? And how would you, I mean, if you had, I know you said you struggled when you were younger, and, and there were times when you thought, you know, if you had been allowed to, 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 uh, well, I, I'm not sure you said it was a case of not allowed to, but if, if you had perhaps had less supportive parents or less encouraging teachers and parents, how would things have played out for you or how would you feel about that? Yeah, I definitely think I wouldn't have ended up on the same track. In, um, like Irish is such an ingrained part of my identity. Yeah, I, I like, spent six years, or eight years, I should say, fully immersed in it. Um, it was a major part and it even pushed me towards like seeing good teachers in practice that's pushed me now going into education as well I don't think I would have got that opportunity and to even like being able to speak in another and being able to speak in the language of our country it is the first language we've spoke it's been spoken on this island for hundreds if not thousands of years um, like that, that history and that, that there is something ingrained in that being able to have that enjoyment say yes it's great good man and do you, you were nodding there, Natasha, you don't come from a kind of a, a family background that, that is big on the Irish, or, or, or do you? Um, but do you, you were nodding when Joseph was out. I agree um, with Joseph, like it is part of our culture. And no, I, don't, I wouldn't come back from a background that like was went through like full education and a full history of it. But I do think like even because of the lengths I went to learn it, I can really understand the history and like appreciate it a bit appreciate it a bit more than what some people might take for granted because I'm going through the lengths to like to learn it and want to speak it and even now as a student teacher when I go in on placements like even what Emily was talking about like linguistic acquisition when we're talking about like you made about like the point about like even like the transfer of skills that you get like from some people that are coming in from different like different countries and it is a new Ireland at the minute and like learning from college and studying and like going out on placement you really see that like, it is sometimes a parent's worry, should they be doing, like, Irish, or should they be focusing on, like, working on their English, but when, in reality, they're transferring the skills from their original language, and it's interesting seeing it from a teaching point of view, because, I, like, I was on the student side for so long, and I still am, I'm still constantly learning the language and learning different things, but I'm kind of getting it from both views at the minute, like, all at once, and it's really interesting, like, even, like, listening to all the different points and saying, yes, because we learn, we know that, like, they transfer skills from different language, if they, they should still read and talk their own language, because they'll transfer them skills when they're learning Irish or English, and... Yeah, and I'm struck by listening to both of you, that you, you're going to bring a lot of, uh, a wealth of personal experience into the classroom, yeah. because you, you've been those kids, you yeah. know, so it's so valuable to have teachers, you know, in a class who maybe the little child with dyslexia mm -hmm. or the child with a condition such as cerebral palsy or another thing will, will know, you know, my moon Thor, you know, is on my yeah. wavelength and gets me because you will. So that's, it's really, it's wonderful to see. Yeah. Go on, you, and you're, I, just you a point to, go on, <laughs> on that. Go on. Like, and I think sometimes even like with someone as a disability, sometimes you can be put into a box and sometimes it is subconsciously, like it's not meant. And like, you, like as I grew up, like you know that it's not meant but you can sometimes be put in a box and it is about having like a mindset, a positive mindset towards things and being able to say, I can do this if I put my mind to it. And it, sometimes I think that's forgotten. Like I think sometimes it's more a worry of trying to get like students with disabilities like through the system and wanting them to just succeed in what their education where it's about just ha like shift. It's more so like working on their mindset. Like I've been in schools, like we're not going in as te like student as a student teacher and seeing it's more of a confidence thing and the minute you kind of build them up a little bit and say you're capable of hard things like you're capable of doing these things instead of 
sometimes I think people like subconsciously just want them want them to succeed but in their own way and put them in a little bit of a box where no you're capable to go outside of your comfort zone and try new things rather than just trying to get through the system you have to. Mm -hmm. So. Now, we were talking, Paul, to go back to you, we were talking about the fact that, I mean, you know, Natasha was, was, was disadvantaged because she needed Irish and didn't have it, mm. and she couldn't do teaching without Irish. But can I kind of turn the tables a little bit? I mean, you know, you could say, well, that's so unfair that she needed Irish in the first place to become a teacher. So what would you say to that? Because you, you could say, well, just because she didn't have Irish, mm. that doesn't mean she shouldn't be a primary school teacher. Yeah, and, and I suppose that's, that's one of the things I see, that uh, if, if exemptions continue to grow as they're currently growing, that that's the next debate is, oh, all these children now have a 12% at the moment, mm -hmm. will it be 20% in five years' time? And then the case will be, well, we can't have it compulsory to become a primary teacher because then we won't have diversity in the profession. Um, so that's the direction we're going in. So I'm, 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 trying, I'm calling, the, I'm saying we should stop uh, the... Um, the Joint Oireachtas Committee on um, Irish Language and mm -hmm. the Gaeltacht and uh, Irish Language Speaks have said that the current system should be scrapped and it should be yes, changed I wanted to, a, to go on to that. a different, yeah. different system, yeah. which is much more, much more restricted, that is an inclusive uh, model of education. And we should be back to something like 1999 when we had about two and a half percent of students with, with an exemption, those who, who really, really needed it and not the those being granted it and you know one of the things that really worries me currently is all the stories I'm hearing and it's a little bit it reflects Natasha's story but um, uh, school school principals as I say now make the decision around exemptions and w the practice in, in many post primary schools I don't have a, a quantity for it but is to say to parents uh, uh, primary school children in sixth class if your child has additional needs if you wish your child to receive support you must have an exemption from Irish so there's a, there's a it's been put to parents regard, and, and this is worrying parents who are you know like people like uh, Joseph's parents who are interested in Irish to say, I, I'm been forced to make a choice now for my child. So you're saying, if I want my child to get support, they have to drop Irish. And perhaps it's a lack of resources in post-primary schools. So I'm sure principals have their reasons, but for timetabling or whatever. So the support classes are being timetabled at the same time as Irish classes. Now, to me, yeah. that's mm -hmm. that's exclusion rather than inclusion, if there ever was. And and it's it's educationally, it just cannot be defended. You know, there may be resource issues and all of that. So it, it, for me, that just cannot be defended from, from an education point of view. And, you know, I'd maybe put a name on what Natasha was, was, was very politely talking about, but I think there's a paternalism in the system. So we're, we're back to sort of 50 years ago where we had a very paternalistic, I know what's good for you as a student. Now, mm -hmm. that went out of education or should have gone out mm -hmm. of education, but I think we still see remains of that, just like the, mm -hmm. as Emily was talking about, bilingualism is damaging. We know now that this isn't the case. Yes, yeah. And just as I know what's good for you, it should be gone. You know, mm -hmm. the agency of the children has to be the mm -hmm. voice of the children. As you said, a 12-year-old mightn't be the best person. But at then the same again, time, uh, uh, they will know as well, you know, we with a bit can, of support. Yeah. Can we ask yeah. them? Can we ask yes. the parents and so yeah. on? How do you feel about that and, and so yes. on? So to me, it, it flies in the face of all the advances we've made in the last 40 years in education. Mm -hmm. Uh, so for me, it's Natasha's it's, desperate to get in. Sorry, <laughs> you're okay. So, but if I can just finish, so on, to yeah, me, it's on. not just about Irish. You know, that's yeah. that's what that's why I'm so passionate about it. Is that it's not just about Irish. To me, it's it just uh, go, it defies all the philosophy of education. It's spelled by the Department of Education, and and this makes no sense. And particularly coming from a department that is pro inclusion. Thank you very much, Paul. Natasha, come um, on back in. Yeah, no, just based off your point, though, that's I was making sure I remembered it. As I, was, uh, we went back. <laughs> I knew that's but, what was going on. Go on. Um, but even like going back to the point, like when I got to the point where I wanted to choose to pick up Irish, I had to fight to drop my French. And like this, I think this goes hand in hand with that because the timetabling of the learning support class were seemed to always be in the Irish because I, I personally think it was because they knew, okay, people are exempt there. Like that's how it worked out. But then when I came to saying... I struggled to do French with Irish, like I did. I Even French before I picked up Irish, it wasn't my strongest subject. So I kind of went and said, I really want to drop my French because I'm confusing it with my Irish and it's not working out. And then I kind of had to fight my battle on that ground. Like I had to say, well, this is the plan if I don't get into tea, like because um, the third language was a requirement for university. 
and that was the main yes. focus of the school like in school it was kind of like well what are you going to do if you don't get your teaching done and I said well I want to do this and I want to go into turn like I, I applied for the turn to teaching program and stuff where I think whereas the opposite happened to me in Irish the main the subject that like the language that I'd done all through primary school it was kind of like hands like to me honest over plate to drop it but then as soon as a new language I picked in secondary school I like really had to fight my ground to like not do it from a leaving cert mm -hmm. so I just think it was a bit Nearly hypocritical in a way. But. Yeah, and I'm listening to you and listen, thinking of what Borg said about paternalism because, you know, I'm wondering, you know, did, did somebody along the way see only your disability and not and miss? And I, listening to you, I don't know how they missed it, <laughs> but didn't see your, your unbelievable determination and your energy and your, your fighting spirit, you know? Um, and I don't know how they missed that, but they, they seem to have momentarily maybe. But, but I, I don't know how we're doing for time. I think we're okay, are we? Um, but can I ask you, Emily, just the, the proposals that the, the Oireachtas Committee came out with um, to, get, no, to, um, to drop the exemption and to have a more, uh, uh, if I get it right, it's that there, there would be a, an exemption around a second language. Um, just, you might explain it a bit more if you can, what is proposed, and also would it work in terms of, just putting it very simply, would it work... Do, do our experts think in terms of reducing uh, the number getting exemptions from this 12% back to the level that it was at originally? Do you want to take that, Emily? Interestingly, and just anecdotally, I was speaking to someone this week, a teacher who had said that um, in the school that they were teaching in, that um, they had been reading reports recently from educational psychologists who had not only recommended an Irish exemption, but also not to study foreign language. So this is, you know, a kind of, it's school-based, of course, whether or not that actually happens and whether that's an option for them. Um, but even for that kind of to be in an option now and uh, kind of with, within the public, public realm now is, is interesting, I think. And I think it's as a result of, uh, of this mindset. I think Porik might have, might do the best yeah. job of accurately describing the Arachthus Committee would you mind, Paul? Yeah, sure. yeah. Um, so, so what they proposed is that the the current system be scrapped, and that um, that it would return to the uh, the National Education Psychological Services, so, so what we call the NEPS psychologists, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. the Department of Education psychologists, as it were, that they would be the arbiters of whether an exemption would be granted or not. So there would be very limited. That would be the idea. So rather than inundating them with thousands of assessments, it would only be in very limited circumstances that a, uh, an exemption would be would be granted. Uh, they do propose also that if somebody was exempted from Irish that they shouldn't they should be exempted from all all second languages. So in other words, it should only be granted to to students who have uh, some disability that prevents them from learning second languages. So, f for example, people may not know, but uh, about 60% of, of um, students at post-primary who have an exemption from Irish uh, study uh, another foreign language, which kind of undermines the rationale for an exemption from Irish mm -hmm. in the first place, because it's nothing to do with a, a language learning disability, which doesn't, doesn't exist according to the, to mm -hmm. the research. Um, do you think it's likely that the Department um, of Education will go with the recommendations? And both of you, either, both? I wouldn't be hopeful. You wouldn't be hopeful? Okay, Emily? Yeah, I think the same. I, I would be very surprised if they did, at least in the, in, the, kind of in the near future. I do think that they're on the wrong side of history with the policies that are here at the moment, and I think it'll be discovered over time, but it might not be the next five years, it might not even be the next 10 years, but I think we'll look back on this time um, as kind of a, a deficit focused time um, in terms of how we view diversity and inclusion. Uh, so yeah, I'm the same as for if not hopeful oh, at the moment. Yeah, okay, okay. Um, do you think even there's, is there any political will in the wider uh, sense in terms of government? Well, I'm not sure about government, but certainly the, the, the politicians on the, uh, the TDs and senators on the John Duroxus Committee, you know, are, are, are open yes, to Yes, as, as two experts in the area, do, what do you make of that recommendation? Do you think it is a good, the good way to go, or do you... Uh, I'll ask you for first and I'll go to you, yeah, Emily. Yeah, I mean, sh short, short answer would be yes, I think it's, yeah. it, it's, it's 
it's what we expect, what, what I expected in 2019 when it was reviewed. All the talk was about this system is getting out of control, so I thought we were going to have a more restricted system which would be targeted more at those who genuinely had a, had a need for it. And instead, what we got was the department washed its hands of it, handed the responsibility onto principals, and made the criteria very loose. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, the undercurrent of everything we're saying is that the parents and, and teachers and principals. Are, 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 are abusing this, that it's a ruse it, to, 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 to get kids off the hook and out of what is perceived by some as a difficult and um, you know, subject that doesn't have any particular use. Mm. I mean, that's really the subcontext of what, a lot of what we're, yeah, we're and, saying here, isn't it? And part of it, I suppose, is... is attitudes that people devalue it and say, well, look, Irish isn't that important. You need to have English. And it's the same, same how we treat immigrants into the country. We assume they won't want to know about Irish. But mm -hmm. actually, um, you were referring to the Gael Skullna before, um, Ashling Nirawan, um, the current director of, of Shalvu, has done some research with um, parents and students mm -hmm. from who speak languages other than Irish and English mm -hmm. at home. And the parents are really happy that their children are learning Irish and they just say, it's fantastic, it's another language. And that's the way they view it. They have none of the baggage we have about it as, mm -hmm. as people who've grown up in Irish. They just see it, isn't it fantastic? They have a third language in school, they have English, they have Irish, they have their home language and they love other languages and they'll be even better still. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's mm -hmm. a, we ourselves are restricting it and, and assuming that immigrants won't be interested in Irish. So yeah, and that's, I, I mean, I, I understand what you're saying, that's doing immigrants a great disservice. Uh, and as and I said, language. you're shutting off a, hmm. a very rich seam of culture for people who have come to a country and who, in most instances, are very keen to, to, be, to, to become part of that country. Um, and I want to go back to Joseph and Natasha as we're winding up, and I want you to ask you both, starting with you, Joseph, if you if you were to, I mean, there, there may be people watching this who are thinking, well, we could get the exemption for our son, or there could be students saying, I could get that exemption, we've got this, I've discovered I've, I've dyslexia or something. What would you say to that maybe teenager or 13, 12 year old or their parents based on your experience? And I'll come to you then, Natasha. Yeah, look, like it definitely would be the easier option in one sense to take the Irish exemption but you're missing out on so much more you're missing out on the ability to interact with more people in the country you're missing out on the ability to come to places like we're in tonight the Shoma Kadra, and talk a language that is native to the country you're missing out on opportunities that you unforeseen opportunities no more than if down the line you wish to go back and do some sort of a project within Irish or if you want to go further field, maybe even go into a degree programme within Irish, you're cutting off that whole opportunity. And it's just, especially when we have opportunities presented to us nowadays, such as assistive technology, we have ways to assist our students with learning difficulties or learning differences in their studies of Irish and other subjects as well. I, I'm thinking when I'm listening to you, you're also, of course, missing out on the opportunity to have a secret language to speak when you go abroad um, and I'll tell a quick uh, story about my brother-in-law who was on a bus somewhere in Canada when he was a student and there were two girls sitting just above the stairwell of the steps up into this bus they were traveling across Canada and the two girls were like oh and um, and so my brother-in-law heard all of this and when he got off the bus and went down the stairs in front of the, the two uh, young Irish women. He looked at them and he said, Bigi Kuramaka Kalini. And he got off the bus. So they were rumbled. Um, but Natasha, can I ask you the same thing? Apart from the really valuable thing of having a secret language uh, when you go abroad, um, what would you say to somebody who, who may be considering taking an exemption? Um, yeah, no, or be, being told, like you, being advised, look, we think your daughter, you know, she can do this extra, uh, you know, work to, to, to help her because she has this disadvantage because of her disability. We feel that, you know, she should consider an exemption. What would you say 
to to somebody in that situation yeah even going off like joseph's point about like assistive technology and stuff like that like there's so much we cater and we differentiate in all other subjects and all other lessons like in the curriculum like it's part of it's it's part of our, the job of a teacher to be able to cater for those needs so i think like there is there is an ability of being able to get support and get like what like get the support that you need or you want to be able to pick up the la- or do the language or pick up the language and i think sometimes especially it depends on this like how the system of the skills or if they're, if they're worried about like oh well these are just flying it they're just doing what they need to do for their junior cert or leaving cert or even in primary school level i think it's really important to remember like if you're able to differentiate and adapt your practices for let's say english or maths or it the same like needs to be done for all like Irish as well, and that's even like been brought in with the new primary school curriculum. It's all true, playful learning and different ways of catering for like the visual, the kinesthetic. Like so, there is a way for the people that they can learn. Like they can learn an Irish, just might not be the same way as the person sitting beside them. Okay, well look, I think that's a really good note to end it on, and I want to pay an special thank you to two, to our two students who came here and uh, gave your own personal examples and st- told your own personal journeys. So Natasha and Joseph, thank you very, very much. And also Emily and Porik for your expertise. Um, we're really grateful and it's been really, really interesting and it's been very, um, I've done a, a speed crash course on everything I need to know now about the exemptions. So that's been really useful. So, and I hope it's been the same for, for people um, uh, watching this um, I, I want to, before we end, I want to give a, a Buikas Moor Le Hifik Nagoelga in DCU um, and to everybody who's participated and everybody behind the scenes uh, who has made this, this all possible this evening and also for anybody who's tuned in to watch, um, thank you very much and we hope that uh, it was an edifying and interesting discussion. Thank you. <laughs>